then I can get some information about the software itself, so the 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 uh, and what you can also do is that you can determine exactly which plugins are currently loaded for the common organization. So at this point in time, we have only one plugin with the to cinematic tools. From there, you can also send comments to those plugins. So, for instance, what I'm doing here is that I'm going to send the command head. So, that command is going to be sent to all the currently loaded plugins, and if they end up at the command, then they will return with whatever permission they want to return to the user. So, for instance, here, the same tools command, uh, plugin, sorry, end of the head command, and tell you why this is what you can do with same tools plugin. Um, now, what I want to do is to illustrate some of uh, the single cinematic tools that you can do. And for this, let me show you very quickly the normal magnetic field model. This is what it looks like in the experience. This is the cinematic part of the normal magnetic field model. And what I want to show you is that you can, using the common version of the protocol, you will export that same file to Python. So basically, we have this kind of format which is used by the protocol that you make the export to Python. And so this is the common line. So it looks like this. So you have export and you have the model. Um, yeah, so it's not very visible. It's <laughs> so what's the Python XML file? So that Python XML file is just a, um, a file that uh, describes a few things that uh, the same API actually needs to do the export from the same to Python. Uh, so just a few things that are specific to Python that are required if you want to do the proper export from the same Python. So here we have the model itself. Then you need to specify the format type. The user has defined the format uh, for the what you want to do. This is what you get. And then all you need to do, well, what you can do is that you can just look at the contents of the oh. <laughs> Yeah, and the thing to be commercial box. I'm asking only the same to plug in that we execute the export command. From there, you can see the different consoles that here, this is a local settlement file. Here, this is a file which is on the internet. And again, I mean, uh, giving this uh, format to be the export for the. Okay, <laughs> 
not sure what's happening here. But, uh, <coughs> what is important is that by getting this element by from actually the model repository and create it with it, and if my internet connection is still okay, which it is apparently, then eventually it should work or unless uh, yeah, maybe it's the final is on to this. Hopefully it's going to work. But working on it. It's going to get all the back and open together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The connection is still to be fine. So, <laughs> and I say it's always a risk with the back in the typical. From there, just go like this. You can see that this the 477 version of a model which was taken from the model repository. From there, what I can also do is that what I'm going to do here is that again taking from the model repository, we have a Cinnamon 1.1 model. And I'm going to convert it to a Cinnamon 1.0 model. So my mention very quickly on that Cinnamon 1.1 models have the concept of inbox. So the idea here is that we are putting that a Cinnamon 1.0 model, which is basically a flattened version of the model which is on the Cinnamon model repository. So here we go again. Okay. just get the next one to the front ready. Okay. So basically, this is the flattened version of that same 1.1 model. And again, you see, if you were to try to export that same 1.0 model to again same 1.0, you just see the software is that the model is ready in that format, so there is nothing to be done. Okay. Uh, so that was for the common line version. That's pretty much that at this point. Obviously, what is going to be interesting is when you can actually start running simulation from the command line. Before we can actually support that, we would like to open code that we support 7 m That's something that we find in the next one. Okay. So from there, you can just run open core as is. If you just run it as if you have any kind of argument, if you just start the GUI, you should something like this. So this is what you get by default when you start up and come. And here, I guess it's very important to keep in mind that everything in open core is a plugin. So if you go here, you can see all the plugins that are currently available in open core and those that are currently being used or not available. So those are the ones that you, you as a user can select. And then there are some plugins which are great as you can see. Which are being used by other plugins. So those are the dependencies for some plugins. Those you can decide whether you actually want to use them or not. It will just be saved automatically for you if they are being useful. So obviously, um, if you are select everything, you will see that you are not getting much out of open now. So you don't have anything now. So if you start again, this, <coughs> this is what you get. So, uh, so that's what I'm saying. Everything in the open we just have open quite pretty much all the So let me really about everything and see again. So from there, basically um, what we have is uh, here different what we call organizational plugins. So, for instance, here we have a Selenium model repository um, plugin that allows you to have access or at least list all the models that are currently available on the Selenium uh, model repository. So, for instance, what you can do from there is just kind of filter things a bit. So, here, for instance, I can just go to this model uh, from there. Go to the model repository, and at this point in time, what you can do from there is just well, see what is available in the model repository, and then 
and if uh, for instance I want to get access to that model, the uh, best I can do is share from And what I can do is I can just open the model, which is the model of the frequency, and so that's called. And it's just cool. Okay, I can see the instance and stuff. So, just open this model from the website. There are other ways of organizing your files here, for instance. Let me go back to this one in a minute. But here we have a file model which is basically easy to access to your local files. And then we have a file organizer that allows you to organize your files in a virtual way. So the point here on this particular plugin is that your files may be physically located in certain places. But if you are working on a particular modeling uh, study, then you might want to create what you might want to call virtual folders. So for example, this study. And from there, you can just drag and drop more from um, just going to drag and drop from files, whatever it is of interest to you for that particular study. So, those files may be in different folders, it doesn't matter, you can just So, it's just for user friendliness to be able to organize your files in the way you want. Um, then, to the right, we have the help plugin. Basically, this is what you are looking at here is a, what we call the user documentation. This is exactly the same as what you see on the similar um, on your <coughs> website. If you look at the user documentation, like this. And the only difference is that within open core, things there will be there is a feature which is not available on the website here. So if I go to this one. Look at this one here. Now, if I go to open the call, do the same. The difference is this one. I'm going back to the other one. Here, that one is this. And open call, you have this. So basically, you have another link. And the reason for this one in a open call is that you can basically send a comment to open call. So the idea is again for teaching purposes, you could create a web page which within open call could send comments to open call for instance <coughs> that you want to create a tutorial that requires a training in CNN file. So rather than having the user to actually open the CNN file itself, you just have a link so you do that for you. Um, and <coughs> What you can do is that what I just did is get as much space as possible. So for example, feature, which sometimes is not handy. So basically, put the dot windows to the left and the right or wherever, and just be clear on the right. Now, looking at this, what we have is that to the left, you have two different kind of uh, modes of functioning. One which is currently the editing mode, the other one simulation mode. And within each of those modes, you have different views. So the idea of these views is that you may, for instance, in the editing mode, to be able to edit same files in different ways. So, for instance, what we have here is the same kind of notation mode, uh, view, sorry. And the idea is that it should go like this, the model. Yes. If I open this one, which is properly annotated, and just so what we can do is that we can see all the annotations which are relevant to this particular model. So what we are looking at here to the left is the full structure of the model with the different elements that make up the model. So you can map how you mentioned units, components, connections, etc. So all of those are available here. And whenever you are talking about seven elements such as C variable. If it has some annotation associated with it, then you will see it here. So, yeah, for this, we are using the bimodal qualifiers. So, what is the bimodal qualifier? We have several of them, I see, which are defined. And if you want some more information about this, you just need to click here, and then you will get some information about the bios and cross qualifier and what it will mean. If you are not interested in this one, then you can just go to a new one, other one, 
So from there, typically what we'll be doing is just enter a term for function set. And what it's going to do here is that it's going to connect to REST service that will be basically suggesting possible topological terms. And from there, you just have to decide yourself which one is actually the one that describes what you want to have. So what you can do is that for each of those ontological terms, you will have a resource from which the ontological term come from, as well as the idea. So if you have a good internet connection, then basically you see that straight away here. But here we clearly don't have a connection. So it's taking forever. So this is for that particular ontological term. You will get some information of the web. Then for resources, etc. So from there, you can just add the ontological terms as well as the added differences that you can become visible if you delete them. So from there, this is currently the way we can annotate seven files in the cloud. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that this is only for annotating using ontological terms. I believe what you would like to be able to do is to annotate using what you want to I understand that that will make sure that I'm so So, okay. um, now if we go back to this, let me open some more of <coughs> using the cloud. Uh, so, if I open more of these, <coughs> now what we can do is that we can go into that raw view. So the idea of this view is that we can just edit any kind of file. So this is a uh, cool view, for instance, that we can just buy another type of file. So yeah, that will still make this for building a open car. So you can just edit synthesis however you want. As we would expect you have to find um, a real text feature. So, uh, uh, so, typical from any kind of visitor. That is for the same uh, the raw view story. And from there, what you can do is that you can go into the raw segment view. So it's slightly different in the sense that it's going to have syntax highlighting for seven kinds of seven based files. And also with a this window, which is used to actually graphically render mathematical equations. So, for instance, here we have one. It may not mean much to you, but this is basically the mathematical code which is used to describe this particular equation here. So, again, if you should put these or execute different equations, the idea is that if I spend a lot of so if you have here a multiplication, you want to go back to the division, etc. If you make a mistake of this field, uh, so this is a way to actually visualize your mathematical equations and make sure that everything is like a way to do this way. So this is about that, I guess, uh, as you probably saw, can increase the size, etc. What is very important also is that whenever you can find an open call, two files will be available from one session to another. So if I close, if I close, oh, <laughs> piece of lovely. Um, so if I start again, you will see that the files are still open or should have been open. So, but we kind of see one of the other things that have been done sometimes. So, if you go to this one, what I want to finish with is just for the same. So, let's see. So, if you go to this to simulation mode, this is what you get. This is again this one. So, what you have at uh, the top left are the simulation properties. So basically, the starting point is different. Often, you want simulation data to be generated. 
and then you have access to the different solvers. So because we are talking about the multi model here, so I think I should mention that open power can currently solve OD models as well as PA models. And depending on the kind of model you are solving, different solvers will be made available to you. So at this point, because we're going to try to solve an OD model, the two solvers will be made available. Again, uh, I mentioned earlier that everything is a plugin, and indeed, uh, here are different plugins for the different solvers. So, um, uh, which means basically that if you were able to come up with a super duper OD solver, you could just create a plugin for it. And if you respect the interface that is supported by OpenCloud, then the solver will become available to you the next time you run the cloud. But here we have the CBOT solver, which offers a few parameters that you can customize. So you can do that here. Then this part I will go back in a minute. But more importantly, here at this point, that we have access to all the model parameters that make up the model. So you have different kind of uh, circles here, big circles of. Uh, one to the four. The one to the four means that basically you can modify the value associated with that particular parameter. For instance, here we have the D parameter, which is the member potential. For that member potential, you can modify the value. Here we have B dash, which is basically B D. So that is the complete uh, variable, so you can modify that. Uh, so that is that. Uh, from there, what you can do and what you would typically do either before or after running the emission is that you can just basically create a graph like this. So we have this one. So what I want to plot here is member potential against time. So we have G against time as this. So if I run the simulation, I get this phase. What we can do is that we can also modify those values like that X and Y values measure in to quantify the V dash as DVD so Okay. If I want, for instance, here I'm not interested in the V or V dash against time, but uh, against memory potential, I can just do this. I can do So this is what you can do here. And from there, I guess you can also create new graphs uh, for like this. So for instance, I can associate here. Uh, why not? IK is the potential current against time. Here I have. Just keep on going again. For instance, I name against I J. This is what you get. What you can do is that you can backward by default those curves with the associated with the current model, which is here. Now, if you want to kind of have a graph to stick to a particular model, you can just say the, uh, the model itself. Like this. So now you can see that the graph is in red, which means that this grid has been to that particular model. So that means that if I go to this one, this model, then I can fix the graph here. And if I run uh, the model here, I see here. Oh yeah, so basically that means that when you get those one in time, it means that basically the graph can be plotted for this particular model. So This is what you can do with the simulation style of the open core. Now, because all simulations are run in the own thread, what that means is that you can basically run several simulations uh, in parallel. So, for instance, um, if I'm here, I run the simulation as this, and um, so we have the simulation as this. So I can also using this core uh, windscreen so things done. So this is particularly useful for instance when you want to demonstrate things for fitting couple of these together. So I can so things done. 
and it was for them one this time. And then I go to a different Zoom uh, five. We see that now I have kind of a progress bar that shows me the progress of the simulation. And if I go back, I suppose this one was once. Then I can go here, from this one of here, this one, like this. So you can run several simulations at the same time and can see the progress here. And when you have the simulation in the ground, then you will see that this progress bar is going to be the and finally, I think is that you can export the simulation data to currently the CSV file, which is like this. And then you can just go to the web and the software and export the results. You just look at that. And then you see the same. And you can do it to more the same And I think it's a day for us to win a show you from all this open call is open call and how it can be used to actually export simulation data to this format by the same way. But uh, when it comes to open call and it's kind of a very interesting pretty much down. Yeah. So if you have any questions, please fire up and you can have a question.
And so we spent the last year or so really rewriting the original C sharp program and developing a C version, which is called MIP program. That's basically the architecture of it. Um, so it's got a number of APIs, including C API, Python API, and C API. Uh, it has various subsections inside. The uh, key thing about it is this uh, JIT compiler. It uses LLVM to compile all the, S all the HTML, which could be to obtained from many sources, including Saturn, I'll show. Sure. Um, but it gets compiled by the VDF um, LVM backend into machine code. So it ends up with very fast sim simulations. And the reason this was done was because one of its main use cases is to provide simulation capabilities for multicellular simulations, for agent, maybe agent based type simulations. Um, and one of the main applications is the proper cell 3D, so I collaborated with the Inglesia and Matrix and so on over in Bloomington in the Midwest. 
And they simulate you know, tens of thousands of cells in the tank state. Each cell has a little network inside, maybe a signal network. And each, you know, each cell has its own simulator. Um, this thing that provides that, uh, that back end for CompuServe 3D. So that we wanted, as, we wanted the thing to be as fast as possible. Which is why we decided to develop a different pilot. So I think this is the first time that LPM has been used for assistive biology uh, in like this. So, as I said, so that's one line which we did develop. Then after that, we just brought together all sorts of other things. So, one other one is antimony, which we have developed as well. I'll describe this in a minute. But this was developed by uh, Lucian Smith, who I know, I know has worked with you guys down here um, on allowing us to read and write SAML. So, this is a human read readable language for describing biochemical networks, IL, SAML, and SPML support. Uh, describe it. So this may be a simple gene network you have. So one gene here, one gene here. That should be P2. Sorry. So this gene, in response to this transcription factor, is produced in protein P1, which gets degraded. In turn, it represses and produces another protein P2, which gets degraded. And then you might represent that in this format. So here I have production of protein P1. This is the rate of the function of transcription factor. This is the degradation rate. This is the second gene producing P2, this is the degradation rate for P2, and I initialize the variables and parameters, and that's the model. Okay. So, um, so with that then I can I can convert this now, this form into SPML or SML. Right? Or vice versa, if I have an SPML file or SML file, I can actually convert it to this form. I'll I'll give you a demonstration of that in a minute. And then other libraries we, we've used, we've also got an SQL to MATLAB converter, which has been around for quite a while and keeps getting updated. It's used quite a lot uh, by some uh, small startup companies that are involved in. Uh, we also started to integrate Auto 2000, which is the new application library that's coming online. It does some simple models at the moment. And then various fitting libraries we installed from various people. Uh, and these are all uh, open source, they're not really steering. Uh, differential evolution, I, I, my, one of my graduates told me about this, and it's an absolutely amazing fitting algorithm. I actually love it. We, when I implement it, so it's a very simple thing. Uh, it basically combines models, and the combined models are better than the original. So there's various fitting um, libraries you could reuse. And then SetML, of course. So luckily, Frank Bergman wrote in secret, I don't know, he wrote this entire library, C C library that supports set and now, which is really incredibly useful for us. So we can just load an SPM set and out and then um, uh, interrogate the SPML file. So this is something we we're, we're, we're currently working on. One of the things we, I want to be able to do is take these combine archive formats and we can load them in. And it converts that combine uh, that that goes beyond the combine archive multiple files that describes the entire simulation experience. So it describes the model and what you did to the model. So it could include SAML or SPML as the model. In principle, it could even include MATLAB. Right? But, uh, but the other thing it contains it could be SAML files, which describes how the model is run. And what we do, we would take that, we convert the model, whatever it is, into antimony, and we convert the SAML into Python. So we have this antimony followed by Python and TypeScript. That you can then run and you'll it will replicate all of the set now. The nice thing about converting into Python is you can have edit it freely and change it and so on. And also once it's in Antimony, you can also change it and edit it freely as well. So this is how it works in progress. The IDE, as I said, the IDE we never developed the IDE at all. We searched around a lot of Python IDEs and I come to the conclusion that the IDE world of Python is pretty in bad state. Um, especially one particular feature we were looking for, it had to be cross-platform, uh, it had to be extensible, preferably in Python, uh, it had to have decent debugging facilities. No idea fit with all that in the uh, The best idea was PyScripter, which is a Windows only one, which was fantastic debugging facilities, but only runs on Windows. In the end, we went to Spider 2. Its debugging is a bit archaic, so it's a command line to debug, but in my case, it runs on multiple platforms and is extensible to Python itself. So the idea is to create, I mean, you're trying to beat MATLAB here, basically. You're trying to beat people off MATLAB on something that's sort of MATLAB-ish. So they will find the transition too jarring, but then they'll find all these other things that they can use at the same time. And they can use the reward of the That's quite people and um, Okay. So maybe I'm going to show you a quick demo of that. 
So, so this is uh, so what you see. This is Spider Two. So we've taken because this whole thing is open source, because we can we can customize it. So the only thing we customize is the little icon that appears up there, which is TE for Telerium. Okay. But eventually, we want to add um, extra plugins and um, menus and so on um, to save people having to remember the command. So let's say you want to convert an SQL model to a seller now, there'd be a menu that you can just do the quick conversion. So this is an example of a model. So you have to express the model as a string. Unfortunately, that's the only way we can do it. But there's the model. S1 goes to S2, S2 goes to S3. Here's some initialization. And then I would load the antimony model. And return, it returns to me on what's called a road run instance. And I just ask it to do the simulation, and then I just plot it. We try to keep things as simple as possible. Three lines, you can do your simulation. Okay? Um, I could get it smaller, I guess, than that. But uh, anyway, you could do that. One of them might be another spider. This is the matplotlib window. As you know, Python, that lot of matplotlib is a common library used by Python people to plot. So we didn't do any, we didn't write any plotting facilities at all. Now, uh, one thing uh, that's annoying is when you when you bring up when you plot something, those hides it behind the window. We did manage to create a new icon down here, which you can click, click select the select the window. But we were trying to work on these things to make it better. Anyway, so there you go, there you go, the plot there. Um, uh, let me see another demo. Um, that this is the one. Actually, this is the model I, I showed you on the on the PowerPoint. There it is here, and I'm doing various things here. Actually, here I'm loading the antimony model. Here I am actually getting the cell and L string, okay, from antimony. Then I'm saving it, and then I'm going to convert it back to antimony, okay. And then I'm going to do some plotting, and finally I'm going to convert the entire thing to MATLAB. And um, I think further down the line, yeah, then I'm saving it. So let me show you some of the means to run this. Let me just see if it's the mission. There it goes. So you always get this slight discontinuity here. This is a poor man's way of doing events. So I basically break the simulation in two. I do one simulation, change the parameter, do the simulation again, and then I just stack the data together and plot it when I get this. So it's a poor man's way of doing events. Very reproducible. Well, I don't understand it to do that. Um, so that ran. So let me go to um, the editor of the course that files here so you can see what it looks like. So this, for example, is the cell and L I exported. Right? And um, I'm going to show you in a minute. So that's the cell and L I exported. This is the MATLAB I exported. But it actually exported this, if I remember right, it actually exported this from the cell and L I converted. I actually converted the model. I took this style now, right, that I generated, converted it to antimony, and converted the antimony then to matter. And if you look here, this is actually the antimony file that was generated from the Salomel file. And one thing you notice, of course, is that the reactions have disappeared. Okay, but what we're left with are the differential equations, uh, initialization, and so on. But this thing, uh, uh, it's basically the anatomy representation of that model. So it's gone through a number of stages, gone from uh, anatomy to SQL, uh, SQL to Salomel, S Salomel back to um, anatomy, and in particular also made the uh, map. Right, so you can do it. Um, this, we only just got this, so I'm, it's, I'm still developing the uh, API for this to make to give us enough functions that people can do whatever they want and do whatever conversion they want. Now, this won't work on all Salomel models, of course, but any of them that have differential equations that should work. So the conversion column is done by Lucien, um, and he's working with me again, so he's updating uh, Anthony. So if you've got any problems, you're happy to use this in every problem, just email, email um, uh, Lucien and chat. The other thing, the final thing here to show you is this one, just to show you that a rig does work. So here, this is the uh, Elowitz um, repressate model in Salomel, which we got from you guys, I think. There's a method called low Salomel model. It returns a Roadrunner instance. I can do certain selections here when I want plot it, do the simulation and plot. <coughs> if I do that, because um, I tried it before. I know that I would get that. So this is an example where I took a cell model from the repository and loaded it and simulated it. Okay? Right. 
So what happens in, what's happening here is just converting it to HTML. Right? We could we could uh, re-engineer the road runner so it takes some out directly and inject that directly. All right, so that's that's that. Uh, we just released 1.0 of all of this last week. Uh, we go to Windows and then some uh, Mac OS. I mentioned. Uh, there's also a documentation for it. Uh, so the two sites, the LibRoder and itself, there's also a documentation just for LibRoder, including Python API, C++ API, and C API. If you go there. Um, it's a bit slow here, but if you go there, there's a lot, lot of documentation. Yeah. Oh, how do you um, Netrunner is pretty, uh, it's not, just doesn't do simulations, but there's things like um, state of states, uh, as we say, sensitivity analysis, and uh, control analysis. And you have access to all sorts of um, other things like reaction rates, rates of change, species concentration, conditions, all, all sorts of stuff. So. We searched around for simulators, and none of them were quite right. For example, I have in Java, which is not use to us, or they're incredibly limited. And, uh, they basically only do, do a time cost simulation, and that was it. And they have no API, it's all run from the command line, for example. Um, so, uh, or others, like Sosnet, are not on the bottom of the chain, with various things like that. So we, we Okay, and finally, um, oh yeah, there's a lot of documentation on the Tellurian ones on the set of Tellurian ones. Um, so, there's a separate project I have which came, comes out of Mount Sinai in New York. Um, they wanted an online tool. So what we did was we basically reused the roadrunner, reused a lot of our tools like like Antimate, like SML to map and so on, and built then a an online presence. This one of the ones I'll show you another one in a minute. I'm not sure you the video. This allowed you to run your models in Python using the iPython notebook. Right? And there's persistency as well. The back end is GitHub, so all this stuff gets called GitHub. And you can do your runs on uh, and the other thing then, if, if you want, if you're interested in more, more visual tools, we have the alternative, which uh, this is still under development, but this is like all this is, if you're not quite sure, uh, where you can render, render your diagram, do your simulations from here, without having on any Python code. And so there's two modes. Um, so let me show you, uh, have we got time? Yeah, quickly, it only lasts a couple of minutes. So. Uh, this is where so this, for example, is this is the online tool. So the model was loaded, simulation was done. You do the usual thing, time and time, time start. You got sliders down here. Um, so I'm trying to show you things. Okay. And a lot of this is just stuff. The only thing we wrote was this piece and all the glue, of course. The rest of it is um, re this is a reusable, uh, this is all JavaScript and HTML5. This is a reusable graphing thing we could found. This is basically the only thing we wrote. And this is a common line that other people can use for graphing, which we wrote for rendering biochemical networks or just networks in general. And then the other thing to show you is the last thing here. I think jump straight to the next video. Can wait a second. Very last few minutes. And this this one then just shows the um, how the iPython works. So all the bio models are available here. You can load up any of any of the bio models and we'll try to render it there. What he's doing here, he's got he's got the model, but he now wants to he wants to explain. He wants to look at a model in Python. He can con he can convert this to view then into the IPython view, which we'll see in a minute. It's fuzzy. Uh, really slow down. Anyway, that's just 
So that what I convert it to is a uh, JSON file, and then it takes the JSON file, which you can't see because it's all fuzzy. <laughs> Okay, you want to see the chase of life. Uh, there it is. Now it's been transferred to the iPython notebook. I'm just going to get it now. There it is. <coughs> and there it's been uh, rebuilt in Python. I wanted to show you this work in progress, but you can do interactive simulation. In the uh, notebook, in fact, it's a big surprise to me when you showed it to me today. So that code up here was all um, Roadrunner code, and he's got some supporting code here. Which Done there. So I can actually get interactive um, interactive simulation even in the IPython notebook as well. But you have to know Python to make this work. So um, this is not for everybody. Uh, but, uh, I think that's All right, I'm just going to just go change this slide and show us. Show us. Okay. Okay. So this is a separate project, I think. But the nice thing is we're reusing a lot of stuff that we're using for the past. You know, it's found with us. Okay. And lastly, my wife didn't give me that to do this. I have to, well, the questions are in the I have to the books and just the funding. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, since you use Python and you're representing these uh, models of your business and your descriptions, do you, um, do you make use of SimPy? No. Because it's quite an effort in Norway, in particular, to um, tie simplify to Python uh, descriptions of model declarative descriptions of models that can then be used with libraries um, to automatically generate C and C plus plus and okay. them into ESOLVs and things like yeah, that. Yeah, we haven't thought about that. But this is all subsidized. But even for the ODEs, they have a they have a domain specific language called Gertrand, for example. But, yeah. um, but SimPy is you know it's it's available and it's um, it's kind of a way of expressing a lot of mathematics that's in Cell and all HTML and Python. Yeah. Make it quite a, it could be a useful. Yeah, I mean we can we, I mean I'm telling you allows you you don't have to write your uh, model as, as a network model. You could write just raw map if you want to. Um, so you can actually write a raw refresh equation if you want. Uh, it also has syntax for event handling uh, and modular. I only showed one, but you have multiple files. That is how it often does the cell now translations. It could be multiple, multiple and so many scripts that are telling you different components in the cell now. And then they did all of this together. And this is how you, you can um, build larger models. So, uh, so it's a library as well, so it can be anybody can fill as many to the application. There are no number of things. Any other questions? Do you want to sit up, Andrew? Yeah, I'll just see. Maybe you maybe should. Will we have time tomorrow? Yeah. I think there's a post that I didn't bring. Yeah. Um, um, 
Dr. Glenn and a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, besides my own, I don't know. Do you want to say something? <laughs> 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 it was more convenient, I can't do it now. Oh, no, I got some stuff I can do. I mean, we can't get more tomorrow with some reproducibility because part of the problem is about reproducibility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got Saturn now, right? Saturn uh, is not, not human friendly, which is why we decided we want to convert it to Python. And once it's Python, then you can edit it to your house for 10. Uh, the problem is convert me back to the pipe to the I mean, set up is an odd, odd thing because it's great for computers, but it's horrible for humans. You know, it's human we're really talking about in the public. So we have to have some way to go back and forth between kind of security, computer readable and human readable. So, so we talked about talk about tomorrow, yeah. This afternoon. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so just very quickly before lunch, hey, yeah, no remembering what I put on these slides, so we'll see where we go. <laughs> um, but this is some of the software I've been working on. I'm going to help with from here. Um, I should have used YouTube as quickly on this machine. Um, so the basic problem we've been trying to look at under the virtual rack project is modeling the nephron. Um, in trying to do it, um, you know, in a modular way using standards and all that. Um, so you have different types of cells at different points, and you want to be able to describe where they are and things like that along the nephron tube. And each of these cells has many different bits and pieces that have some very specialized function. And they all, you know, so you can build up this hierarchy of models that you want to use. I'm just focusing at the cell level. We've been working on these tools I'm calling Getch. Um, it seem like a cool name. Um, and it has various different parts um, for creating models, simulating models. Um, sort of prototype web service things that you might want to eventually incorporate into a repository, a web application, um, and it's also just using my standard cellular simulation tool. In terms of the web interface, um, as Peter mentioned before, we're trying to work on a drag and drop system for building up models. So the idea um, is that here you would have this library of models that come from the repository based on some sort of searching or whatever you want to do. Um, it could be classified into different types of models for different purposes. And so then you might want to start with just an empty cell model. Um, and then you want to sort of basically build it up depending on exactly what you're doing. So what we've been working on is ways that you can drag these components out of your library, drop them into your model. Um, at the moment, purely graphically, just you get little cool green things if it's good, red things if it's bad, so you don't see that. Um, and that's the end of it. So you know, always you can put a transporter in the memory to account for the down as you see where the mouse is in these three shots. It looks good out of place. So, um, so you get those sort of rules that are defined potentially as annotations of the cell memories that these are coming from to say where it's valid, what it, where it's not valid. Um, and all that sort of information coming through web services. Um, and then eventually being able to link it up and visualize simulation results. Um, you can read it. You know, so here you got the different protocols that are associated with this particular model. Um, 
which would typically be CML. Um, and we're also using the lib CML rank um, to do this. And then to take that, a while ago we did some work where we embedded the Zinc plugin in a web page and that would let you navigate around the hierarchical model of the Nephron. Um, so you could do various things in either the Zinc window to, to work your way you know, from the top of the Nephron, you get simulation results, diving down into cell models at particular points, and from the cell models into a particular transporter. Um, and then also, a while ago, I did some work looking at these reference descriptions where you want a nice web view of an entire um, collection of models or simulation studies. Um, so we had that work sitting around, so lately we've been trying to start bringing it all together. Um, only a problem is that the Zinc plugin doesn't really work um, and isn't um, a way to go to the future. So instead, um, we've been working on a new approach. Um, we basically have a very simple Python desktop application now with the Zinc library. You know, embedded in one window to give you a 3D model. And then basically the rest of this interface is just a web page. Um, so this now gives you um, sort of interactive web stuff embedded in a Python app to communicate with Zinc. So you get back this sort of interactive 3D thing. We can do things in a 3D model um, that would then you know, change what you see here and so you can navigate through um, if I had it running in the text player, um, you know, zoom in to the kidney and get different results from the search. You dive down into the next one. And then from there, you now have exactly that sort of get web application embedded in this application. So if you know the right series of steps to navigate through that hierarchy, you can end up there. And you see this with the benefits of it, it's all in one platform. So you can now you know, assemble or modify your cell model at this scale and zoom back out one day to the whole human group of the changes that. Um, similarly, you can you know, jump to the full description. Um, and if you wanted to look at the mathematics and everything um, underneath. So very quickly, there's a few things on the web. Um, nowhere near like the documentation you just saw from here, but there is a little bit. Um, and if you want more information, to be around. Um, so that's it. Any um, questions? What would it take to make it not the best? Uh, there's nothing in there specific to the Necron except that it's what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, it's all so um, I'm sure there's probably a bit of between somewhere. But in theory, it should all be driven from the end. That's what I mean. Um, I'm expecting you, you, you were referring to the uh, pure web based JavaScript um, way of doing it. And, and as you know, we've had issues with trying to maintain the same plugin um, on there. Could you see all this working with a web service or you know, like running an instance and things? Is communicating to Loop DL yeah. um, and, and, and as a way of getting back that Loop um, experience. Yeah. 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 Are you limited by the, the interaction you can have between your kind of visualization thing and your text of your web page um, view? Like, in terms of really interacting with the model and presenting stuff in sweep flow of information. Ah, so the only real limitation is the physical separation. I'm not wanting to wait for any more things on top of it. You know, little pop up files and stuff. But otherwise, it's just all the between the, basically the JavaScript and the web stuff in the Python. And the, so, um, you've probably seen Kinkus over here. So, that's an example of um, 
driving things along and building it. So that's not a problem anymore. Yeah. Um, of course, you're going to need to go further, but uh, this one is not going to be driving components. We had a lot of components that were available to drive it on the campus. Just he packed the road to develop his own XML format for representing files. So, but they're going to be nice to be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. And I just remembered that you have. Have you got that? Yes. Yeah. You should check that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we won't actually have time today for a dedicated go around and play with software, but feel free to grab any of the software developers around uh, to talk to us. About any of the tools. Okay. Um, so this is basically a web interface that's going to be developed, which is being developed by some people in the Netherlands. Uh, there's a group of uh, Chandler who used to be a postdoc in Oxford, and that's uh, how he basically got acquainted with Sen uh, and etc. Uh, and yeah, basically David and my contribution is just kind of more consistency contribution than I can see. And uh, basically that tool is being used for teaching purposes, and it has already been run to a particular course that they run, I think, like two weeks ago. And it is pretty nice, actually. And this is the kind of thing that we can do with SendMS. And the video that they want to like us to actually show is this one. And the idea is that you can create a virtual app. And the point of this probably is going to be a relatively straightforward. But um, the idea is that you can set it a SendMS file. And then you can specify which parameter you actually want to show and uh, from there you'll be able to create sliders, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, from there the user can just move the slider, run the simulation, see what happens. And this is what they actually use for teaching purposes. So I'm just going to show them that you watch. Actually, I might just add that now they do have a public website for this. And there is also the poster just on the side. So if you are interested, you can go to the website and you can use it as well. You won't be able to create a lab uh, interface like this. This is only for the teachers, but you will be able to use existing labs that will be brought for us for the students. So what they're doing here is just basically creating the web interface in terms of the GUI, etc. So this part is just what they actually want to plot, and this is going to be what they want the user to be able to play with. So for instance, here we have the external consultation of potassium that is going to be available for the user to modify. And what we just saw is that we collected that to particular sediment variable in the model. I think it's pretty much ready and it will be able to actually run and use the model as an answer. So this is the interface that you get. So you can just run and then you will get your membrane potential as it is. And here this is the parameter that we made available through the lab. And that parameter you can modify and you can see that there is a slider just underneath which you can use to modify the value and straight away when you will see the effect on the membrane potential. So this is one very simple example of how you can actually create a virtual lab 
But there are also examples that are obviously more complicated than that and more relevant for Jewish uh, students. But, um, yeah. What is that? So as I said, there is a professor outside. Now you do have also a public website, so you can have a plan to see reports. And I'm sure they will be more than happy if you have uh, some feedback on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that. Thank you. Probably any questions, there's contact details on the website. So um, I'm sure there's other things that could go But it's well past lunchtime. Um, so maybe if we go we'll take a break of 45 minutes um, and start in the quarter to review. Um, I'm trying to get, finish some time to catch the period. <laughs>